Welcome back to Cityscape. This is part two of the story of Howard Hughes. In part one, we covered his early life and ventures. We also took note of the fact that Tony Starks is a character based on the life of Howard. Let's review the facts so far and see if this statement holds true. Howard Hughes was born rich. Tony Stark was born rich. Howard Hughes was a technical genius from a young age. Tony Stark was a technical genius from a young age. Howard Hughes' mother and father died early, leaving their empire to the young Howard. Tony Stark's mother and father died early, leaving their empire to the young Tony. Howard vastly expanded the Hughes tool company his father left them. Stark would vastly expand the business his father left them. Hughes was a defense contractor, building cutting-edge technology for the military. Stark was a defense contractor, building cutting-edge weapons for the military. Most revealing of all, Howard Hughes suffered a fatal accident, shifting his heart to the right side of his chest, leaving him dependent on opiates for the rest of his life. Tony Stark suffered a fatal accident, damaging his heart and leaving him dependent on technology indefinitely. Lastly, Howard Hughes was called to a Senate hearing regarding his reconnaissance aircraft and flying boat. Tony Starks had a hearing regarding his suit where he basically told Congress no to their demands. The Senate hearing is where we left off in part one, so we will pick up from there. You are before this committee, and you're going to answer the question. You asked me just now uh, about a reply that I made. My answer is I don't remember. Now, the man is well, taking down you again. Him. What? Will you bring Mr. Mars in at the 2 o'clock session? Uh, I, no, I don't think I will. Will you try to bring him in? No, I don't think I'll try. All right. The goal of the investigation committee was to find out what happened to the $40 million the military provided the Hughes Aircraft Company for the production of planes that were never delivered. Officials suspected Howard was using the defense contracts to line his own pockets. However, the truth is that the technical challenges of building a flying boat were overwhelming Howard. First, the sheer size of the vessel made the flying boat an immense challenge. The Hercules is five stories tall weighs 200 tons, the wings are the span of a football field. That's more than a city block. To this day, the Hercules H-4 is the largest flying boat ever built. As if this wasn't enough, wartime restrictions on metal prevented Howard from using aluminum, so the flying boat had to be built out of wood. The technical difficulties drove Howard nearly insane. The money given to Howard was not squandered on profiteering. In fact, Howard had poured some of his own money into the project. He would go on to say, I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back. And I mean it. During a break from the Senate committee, Howard flew to California to show the world that the Hercules H-4 was indeed capable of flying. With Howard at the helm, along with seven members from the press and 28 staff members, the Hercules H-4 lifted off and remained airborne for 26 seconds. Despite how brief that flight was, it proved to the public and the committee that Howard had not squandered the money. The Spruce Goose, as critics called it, can indeed fly. I think the United States owes a great debt of gratitude to Mr. Howard Hughes for conceiving 
and for constructing this great plane. It's one of the most valuable contributions to aeronautical science, I believe, which has ever been made and will be of inestimable value not only to aviation, but I believe eventually to the country's security. The Hercules H-4 never flew again, however. It can be seen today at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum, about an hour drive from Portland. Those of you who want to visit this gem can save this location on a Cityscape app. After the Senate hearing, Hughes Aircraft would go on thriving. It became a major aerospace and defense contractor, manufacturing numerous technology-related products that included spacecraft vehicles, radar systems, the first working laser, missile systems, ion propulsion engines for space travel, commercial satellites, and much more. The Hughes Aircraft Company would later be sold to General Motors for $5.2 billion in 1985. General Motors then sold it to Raytheon for $9.5 billion in 1997. Back to our timeline. The Senate hearing was definitely a win for Howard, but having suffered numerous plane incidents, his mental state began to worsen. To give you a reminder, Howard suffered his first plane crash while shooting Hell's Angels in 1930. Later, in 1935, he would also make a forced landing while testing the H-1 racer, a.k.a. the Silver Bullet. It was during this run, at a speed of 370 miles an hour, at a height of approximately 20 feet from the ground, that the motor quit. Howard would also crash the Sikorsky S-43 aircraft in 1943, killing an inspector and one of his employees. Howard himself suffered a severe gash to the head during that crash. Lastly, we covered the near-fatal crash of the XF-11 in part one of this episode. All these injuries and blows to the head would take their toll on Howard. He was becoming increasingly mentally unstable, making poor financial decisions throughout his businesses. His eccentric behavior did not go unnoticed. His compulsive behavior, coupled with the bad financial decisions, led the managers of TWA to force him out. Howard owned 78% of TWA, a company he had vastly expanded by acquiring air rights for transcontinental service. The sale of his shares bought him a whopping $546 million. Howard Hughes was by then a multi-billionaire having a net worth of $11 billion when adjusted for inflation. After cashing out of TWA, Howard withdrew from public view. He lived on a top floor of hotel rooms, never stepping a foot outside his penthouse. He surrounded himself with a small army of personal assistants and also rented nearby rooms for his wife and girlfriends. I mentioned wife. Recall in part one that Howard married Ella Rice in 1925. The couple had divorced in 1929, as Howard was dating all the beautiful starlets in Hollywood. But in January 1957, Howard Hughes married Jean Peters, a Hollywood actress who would also become an American icon. The two would remain husband and wife until 1971. In the last couple of years of their marriage, Jean Peters would frequently ask staff members if they had seen her husband. Howard had completely disappeared. He did not want people to see him anymore. But why? My very dearest, I love you so much. I will be expecting you tonight, and I will try to have something you will like to watch. Please love me back, and please don't give me up as a lost cause yet. I hope not to have any stomach aches tonight, and I am having the doctor come now, so we won't be troubled with him. If something upsets you tonight, please write me a note and tell me about it. I love you again, and again, and then some more. Howard Dearest love, I will be looking forward to seeing you at 10.30 or 11. I love you very much. Jay The first reason behind this seclusion was the crash of the XF-11. It had left them scarred, disfigured, and increasingly dependent on pain meds. His daily doses of pain medication rose to 8 times that of a normal patient. 245 grams of codeine a day, 150 milligram of Valium a day. The second reason, however, is probably worse. 
His obsessive compulsive disorder was increasing. In order to prevent contact with germs, Howard would give his aides copiously detailed instructions when serving him. The FBI, who was secretly surveilling Howard, said in their records that Hughes acted like a screwball maniac capable of murder. They even recommended having Howard committed. If you think the FBI is exaggerating and should probably mind their business, here is an example of some of the instruction Hughes gave his personal aide. Washing of can. He should first soak and remove the label, and then brush the cylindrical part of the can over and over until all particles of dust, pieces of paper, and in general, all sources of contamination have been removed. It is equally important to me that nobody ever opens any door or opening to any room, cabinet, or closet, or anything used to store any of my things, even for one thousandth of an inch. For one thousandth of a second, I don't want the possibility of dust or insects or anything of that nature entering. Howard's behavior would only get stranger. He would sit in a dark room, often completely naked, with just a piece of tissue covering his genitals, and watch movies on repeat all day. He would not shower for months. His hygienic conditions was abysmal. Despite this unsanitary way of living. Howard would still give detailed instructions to his personal aide in order to avoid germs. Howard was practically insane at this point. What's more marvelous, however, is that despite Howard's condition, his empire grew. He was the owner of the Hughes Tool Company (RKO), Hughes Medical Institute, Hughes Aircraft. He won Cold War defense contracts, and he acquired vast real estate holdings in Las Vegas. Transforming the landscape of that city. By 1970, Howard was a virtual prisoner inside his blacked-out hotel room. He fired his chief of operations, Robert Mayhew, and turned the day-to-day -day operations of his empire over to a group of Mormon aides. It was all downhill from there. The Mormon mafia, as some people call it, really did not help Howard. They further cut him from the world, using his drug dependency as a tool. To get him to sign expensive salary contracts for themselves, Howard would then move to London, living in hotel rooms as usual. While there, he flew a plane over the London skies, piloting in a nude, of course. Howard recalled this was the last time he felt free. A few days later, Howard would fall and break his hip. He never walked again. Howard laid so weakened that he can no longer inject himself with medication. He was flown to Acapulco. In order to get more readily access to drugs, the Mexican doctor that saw Howard was so alarmed that he asked why Howard was not taken to a hospital. On April 6, 1976, Howard Hughes fell into a coma. Four hours after his doctor arrived, Howard was loaded onto a plane to head for a hospital in Houston, Texas, his hometown. As the plane approached the airport and prepared to land, Howard Hughes passed away. The great aviator died in the sky, where he belonged. Pulled up, type of appearance, like he had lost a lot of weight. He looked almost dead when he boarded the airplane. You know, his eyes were wide open, and there was really very little life at all, if any, left in him. I, he was alive though, because I did notice his mouth moved just a, a little bit once or twice. As we、uh, were taxiing into the customs ramp, the、uh, doctor in the back said, "Just take your time. There's no need to hurry any longer." That's how we knew at that time. He、uh, died apparently as we were descending into Houston, just as we were coming and approaching the airport. His autopsy showed clear signs of neglect. His grooming was terrible. His head had a gaping sore. A bone was taken out of his right shoulder. He had seven broken needles in his arm, and his body was emaciated. If sheer neglect was a crime, his aides would be guilty of murder. What's worse. His personal aides try to conjure a phony will after Howard died. The so-called Mormon will gave 1.5 billion dollars to various charitable organizations, including 470 million dollars to his aides. Thankfully, the Nevada court ruled the Mormon will a forgery and split Hughes' 2.5 billion dollar estate amongst his 22 cousins. 
My life with Howard Hughes was and shall remain a matter on which I will have no comment. Howard should not have survived the XF-11 plane crash. The fact that he lived 30 years beyond that is nothing short of a miracle. But it came at a price, both physical and mental. Many people think Howard lived a privileged life, doing whatever he wanted from cradle to grave. This is definitely true to an extent, but Howard also stood for something. He took financial losses creating Hell's Angels, an aviation film. He took losses designing the Spruce Goose, the first prototype for large transport planes. And as a test pilot, he took physical damage from numerous plane crashes that rendered him deaf and disfigured. Try to imagine yourself getting into the cockpit of one of these prototype planes, knowing full well this might be your last trip. Would you have the courage to do it like Howard? Hugh's entire life was dedicated to the advancement of aviation, man's attempt to conquer the sky. So next time you're on a plane to whatever destination, think Howard as one of the leaders that paved your trip. See you next time. <laughs>